Um, before I start um, my presentation, I will probably need to make a, a disclaimer or actually two disclaimers. One is that any views or recommendations that I say or, um, or, or state uh, is just my view and not my employer's view. And, and also uh, not, it, it doesn't associate with uh, any of the in institutions that I represent. Uh, the other thing is any products or any suppliers that I would discuss um, through my experience that would, yeah, my intention would not be to promote that product or brand. Uh, it, it's purely um, taking out of from my experience. <clears throat> so without um, further ado, I'll uh, start on to the content. So today I will be speaking about um, a quick overview on the Australian context and then the history, uh, types of rail we have, types of tracks, the type of rolling stocks we use, and then the value uh, it brings to the, uh, to the country and to the society. Uh, and then I will go into the signaling basics. What is it? Why is it? And going through the components of it and how it interfaces with rest of the rail world. Um, I also will go through how the signaling and the train operations link. I'll get some few examples, uh, probably um, shoot a video um, explaining how, we, how it all works together. And then I'll describe how a, a simple design that can be done uh, for a simple rail section. So that would include um, using a signaling plan using a TD graph or time distance graph. And I'll give an idea of what the future may look like using a, a current project. So uh, bef before I go further, if there's any um, signaling engineers joining probably, um, I would like to say it may not be into your sort of expectation if you're expecting to have a high level of knowledge. This is going to be a basic um, insight, um, just to sort of give the flavor of what signaling is. So now, hopefully in your screens, you could see the Australian um, rail plan. Um, what we'll do is uh, I'll try to zoom in where you could see the legend. So then that way you sort of understand what it is and what it, uh, what's it. Um, so you would, you would notice there's different types of gauges here. Um, it's a broad gauge, standard gauge, and narrow gauge. And you would see it's color-coded uh, depending on the usage. So we got passenger, freight, interstate, and even uh, some of the suspended lines are being shown. So here, if I start from the west or um, northwest, um, this would link to most of the freight network and it's privately operated and privately owned. Um, so some of the major companies are like Rio Tinto, uh, BHP, um, uh, FMG and Roy Hill. So they, they would be all connecting to all these ports and um, connecting to the shipping lines. And this big thick artillery is the interstate connections. So that carries both, uh, it would be carrying both uh, freight and passenger. And another thing is um, most of the interstate, or actually all of the interstate connections are uh, standard gauge, uh, which is the most popular around the world. So, so when I say uh, the, the gauge, it's the, uh, the width between the tracks. Now, if I go to the major cities, Perth, that's more green. And that's uh, purely because uh, it's got narrow gauge. And then here you see another freight line. So most of these um, freight networks are actually, if you see, they are into more ore and, and coal. So added it, it's got a smaller network. I'll talk about Melbourne. I've got a, um, a different slide for that. And if I go to Sydney, um, 
that has all uh, most of its connections are actually um, standard gauge. Uh, and in Melbourne, you would actually realize it's, it's there's a mix of it. So there's broad gauge and standard gauge. And if you go to Brisbane again, you would see it's a lot more green. That means it's narrow gauge. And mostly this is for the sugarcane um, freight um, just to move to the, the ports around. So if I, let's see what else is useful in this map. Probably something worth telling about this. Um, this is a Hitachi locomotive. Um, this is actually now it's been driverless, so it's auto fully automated, and and then the the train length itself can carry up to 1.5 kilometers or 1.2 to 1.5, and um, it it was done quite recently. I think it was um, finished um, start of this year. And, and it's the world's first uh, automatic um, uh, railway. So we got a light rail, which I will speak uh, in a bit. Yeah, I think um, that's pretty much covers what we want to speak in this slide. Um, and also you would see that there's a growth in the, in the freight rail use. Obviously, this is probably a bit old but, um, but that has been the case for the last couple of years or last few decades. So here I've got the, the Victorian state. I'll use one of the base points. So this blue network is the standard gauge, which connects across to the the neighboring states. So here we got New South Wales, here we got South Australia, which uh, the major city is Adelaide and this and Sydney. And you got the orange lines, that's the broad gauge. That's the most common uh, most common gauge in, in Victoria. And all this is the regional um, suburbs or regional um, network. And here we got the Metro network so Metro network is mostly electro electrified, um, except um, the Stony Point line up to Frankston, um, just this sort of a short line here, uh, but rest is all electrified and except the purple line here and, and the one which actually connects to the regional. So I've sort of got a zoomed up um, the, the heart of CBD or the Metro section uh, let me zoom into it a bit more that way you would have a clear picture oops so here you would see it's so the whole network connects into like a loop um so for example if someone catches the cranwell line train it comes across comes to the city and in the mornings it would have an anti-clockwise direction and goes back again into the same line. And in the afternoon, it goes the, the other way, um, the clockwise direction. So there, there, there's a historical reason to it. So Parliament, Melbourne Central and Flagstaff, all these premier stations, there used to be a lot of people working in the city around those areas. So to cater for them, for the, the for the passengers, um, um, there was a, a direction change from morning peak to the afternoon peak or the evening peak. Now it's slowly we are trying to change the, or have a standard direction, and also we are trying to untie the loop um, as the demand and and especially with this population growth, um, we need to expand further, and and we are trying to have um, just line direct lines connecting to. Um, for example, uh, Pakenham line will be connected to um, uh, to the Sunbury line in the in the um, once the once the new project is completed through the Melbourne Metro Tunnel. 
uh, there will be a video of it um, later in the in the slides. Okay, so if I go to the history of rail, um, so the, at the start, how how rail started was uh, mostly for goods, and and this is just general in the whole world, um, and and what they found was that rather than moving the wheels just on a normal sort of a road, if you put it on a track, it, it's much more smooth and it's much more easier. So starting off from that, then it went to um, steam engines. So uh, like somewhere around 1700s uh, when James Watt invented the steam engine. Uh, and that's when things started to ramp up a lot more. Um, and, and what happened was, yeah, it, it increased in sp speed and power. But what happened was that also caused a, a problem with having more accidents. So, so different countries actually came up with um, ways to, to fix it. So one way was with the legislations. So they had like here in Australia at the moment, we have the, uh, the RSNL or the uh, Rail Safety National Law. So that states, um, how much of safety we need to uh, put in in our designs and, and in all the engineering works we have to do. So in, as a thumb up rule, we say so far or so far as reasonably, reasonably practicable. And we sort of carry across that to from design to our, um, our final stage of testing and even in operations. So initially, all the, all the signaling started manually. So people had flags and, and or indications um, just by hand signals. And then it moved on to lanterns. And then it went on to mechanical uh, with levers. And then it moved on to the indications of signal. So with this signaling, you would notice this has like a rabbit ear. What it means is it actually is a root signal. And the root signal is actually coming mostly from um, the UK context. Uh, in, in Victoria, we are actually using speed signaling. So if you see these signal combinations, it actually means a, a different speed. I'll, I'll explain a bit more about it too later in the sides. Um, and we have uh, a train control center so that actually, that's where the signaler sits or the, the, the central uh, signal signaler sits and then he, he could control um, the control signals and then uh, set routes and then also work around to the timetable. And also um, there will be another section uh, similar to this where who manages the, uh, when there's uh, sudden events or uh, disruptions uh, that will be managed by so this one is the sort of the, we are stepping into the future sort of thing. Um, so where the cab signaling comes in. So what happens is all these trackside signals won't be used and then everything will be indicated on, on the cab or in cab signaling. Um, but today I won't be talking about that. Um, the focus would be on the conventional signaling and mostly on the Victorian. Um, and I uh, hope you get to um, understand a bit more on that later on. So I think I can't skip light rail because um, Melbourne is quite popular for its light, light rail, um, having the largest light rail network, um, expanding for about 250 kilometers. And this is the, the new E-Class Bombardier um, trams we are using in the city. Um, it, it's generally, um, more uh, lo longer than the the previous versions, and then also it ha it carries a lot more capacity of passengers, and also there's easy accessible for wheelchair users and and special needs um, passengers. So this is uh, one of the B class trams, uh, probably built up in 1980s. Um, this is the City Circle, a free tram service. Um, it's, it's more of the heritage trams um, built probably in the 1920s or between 1920s to 1950s. 
And this is the inside of a B-class tram. And these ones are actually early 2000 or between 2000 to 2010 uh, C-class tram and a D-class tram. This D-class tram is not really popular among people because it doesn't really have much space around. Um, so yeah, it's, it's getting quite unpopular. Uh, and then these ones are getting retired and, and more of the E-class or the new ones actually called the F-class. I couldn't find a picture of it, but um, yeah, uh, it just looks much more similar to this. Another, probably another word thing you could notice is with the trams, most of the the undercarriage stuff, um, with, uh, most of them are actually being moved to the top of the tram now, so that way the tram has a lot more lower access. And, and if you see the pantograph is actually, yeah, it's quite closer to the, uh, the power line. I'll move on. So we have two types of track. I mean, I explained uh, probably in the, more in, in the rail map I used in the first slide. So we have the broad gauge, so it's broader than the, the standard gauge. That's where probably the names comes from. So it's 1600 millimeters and you got the standard gauge at uh, 1435 millimeters. So this is a special area where you could see both um, standard gauge and broad gauge. I'm not sure whether it's convincing enough, but this is actually broader than this track. And you would notice this is electrified and this section is not. Mostly this is used for the regional and the freight network. And this is for passenger. And then we see a V-line train, which is connecting to regional um, suburbs. And um, yeah, I'll, I have a slide on, on, on rolling stocks later on as well. So that way probably we can go through about the sprinter. So freight trains, um, this picture is not from Victoria, even though um, we will be having double stack um, freight lines um, after completing an inland project. Um, what I want to actually point out with the freight trains was that uh, we find it a lot more cost effective um, in terms of uh, using trucks. So when I say trucks, I mean these semi-trailers, they're probably about 100 meters long even with just two and sometimes you can have three and four. So you could imagine how long even these road uh, trucks are. I mean, you basically call them road trains. And here is um, one of the, the facts which I've taken off from the Australian Rail Association. So one freight actually equals to 110 trucks like this. So that's a lot of trucks um, that a train carries. Um, in, in terms of its uh, freight worth. And what, what it does is that it minimizes road accidents and a lot of lives will be saved because yeah, minimizing accidents means and then through injuries, which means it's gonna save a lot of money, uh, whether it's costing the government or insurance or any other uh, from personal matters either. And it's always said to be that yeah, rail is a lot more safer compared to the road freight. And um, I've mentioned this, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot more cost effective too. So let's move on to the passenger trains. So this is uh, from the Metro fleet. So these ones are quite old. Um, it's, in, it's in its retirement now. Um, these were put into use in the 1980s. Yep, uh, and then um, yeah, it's, it's, it has six cars and uh, built by Cominge and it was built in uh, Victoria itself in, in Dandenong, um, a suburb in Southeast. It carries yeah, passengers of 536 um, and sorry, 550, yeah, 536 to 56 seated or withstanding uh, 1526. Maximum speed 115 kilometers an hour, uh, train length 142.4 meters. 
So this is the next version from the comment. Um, and it's uh, it's called the extrapolis or extrapolis. And um, that, that's probably a bit more um, spacious compared to the comment. Uh, but obviously the, the length is kept the same. However, inside you would see um, there's a few changes that has created a bit more space. So this was introduced in the early 2000s um, and, and it would have six car sets too. So we had a few of these uh, Nexus Siemens um, trains introduced to the network. Um, it's quite the same in terms of um, the train length and, and, and with the capacity probably, yeah, meeting the same around extra place. Um, and uh, this wasn't quite the most popular train um, due to its um, braking um, issues, but um, but it, it is still in our network and 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 it uh, yeah still uh, does our purpose or fulfill our purpose. So this is the new train that that comes to um, the network, or it, it's probably it might start from next year or. Um, it will definitely be in the Met Melbourne Metro Tunnel loop if once that uh, project is completed in 2025. Um, so this is actually quite different to any of these. Uh, with the train length, it's actually longer than that. So with 160.2 um, and also the speed would be at 130 Ks. So that's basically the, the maximum speed mostly governed by the infrastructure allowable speed. So that's why it's, you would notice it's actually, yeah, set at 130. So the passenger trains, you got the Metro, which is electrified, and then you got the passenger trains for regional, which is non-electrified diesel locomotives. So these um, run quite far distances. Um, and so you got, actually uh, several classes here. So these are the new ones uh, called Velocity and these ones called the, the uh, N-class uh, locomotives. This one's actually not in service. Uh, it's just for sort of conservative or sort of conservation um, or heritage sort of purpose. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a old A-class uh, train uh, probably used in the 1980s. So these ones were introduced in the 80s, but they're quite good um, in, in terms of um, yeah, getting getting the job done. And they are in their retirement too, and, and most of these velocities will be coming to the network. And they are also locally built, um, mostly being assembled in Dandenong. Um, so 60% of the job is done in done locally. So this is a sprinter. Um, maximum again, all, all these trains are kept at 130 Ks due to the uh, infrastructure limitations. So value of rail. Uh, so I've sort of been giving a few facts earlier on about the value of rail. So carbon emissions probably now at the top, um, probably after COVID anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, carbon emissions are on, on the top list anyway for any industry and, and it's a global problem. So moving, switching from road to rail actually is, uh, a, is a, it, it does make sense. And I think it, it, it is for the right reasons. And then of course, if you look at the safety aspect of it, rail is safe and, and it's getting safer. So that would eliminate most of the accidents that will happen on the road and in return, that will save a lot of money. So again, we are in, in terms of the congestion and in terms of timing, um, that would be really beneficial. So um, I think there's a lot more value that goes into rail. And if you look at the employment in the rail sector in Australia, so that, um, and, and these figures probably are a bit old because these are from 2015, um, and you would still see, yeah, it count to about yeah 30 billion dollars. So that's that's quite a lot in, in terms of um, um, 
of the population who is involved in the rail sector. So as a state, we are growing and, and we are going quite strong. So we have 110,000 people every year coming in um, to the country or, or, or by uh, birth uh, in, in Australia or in, in Victoria. So there's a lot of uh, population migrating from overseas. So and everyone needs to have access to the public transport. So which means we need to have a stronger rail network being the, the backbone of a city. Um, the rail network has to uh, make sure that it connects across all the intermodals. So obviously the government recognize the, the value of rail. So if you look at the past 10 years or even further, there wasn't much investments. And then suddenly you had some investments um, in, in after the GFC in, in 2008, 2009. And it actually saw a lot of value. There was more re uh, return on investment uh, from the government's point. So that's when they started to put more projects. And now we are somewhere around here. And what we are actually heading is for a tsunami <clears throat> of work. So what you see in green is for the Victorian projects. So that's quite significant. And, and also you see a lot of New South Wales projects Okay, so let's get back to the core of the, the presentation today. So it's, it's about rail signaling. So I'll ask the question, what, what's the rail what, what is rail signaling? So I've taken from the Australian standard on, on rail signaling and, and principles. So the principal function of a rail system or signaling system as part of a system of safe working is to communicate movement authorities from a network control officer to rail traffic crews so as to allow the safe and efficient operation of railway. So I want to point out a few keywords um, here probably. Um, so one is safe working and then communicating. And then this is a rule. Yeah, again, safe and efficient. So it, it has quite major, like these are the two key major functions. So to have safe and efficient operation. So that's done through using the control officer, communicating to the control officer and having a safe working method. So let's see why we use signal. So I did take the example of uh, from the history where there were a lot of collisions at the beginning. So the trains were initially um, sort of going in a time-based interval, but not having controls around it. And what they realized was, yeah, the trains were colliding either head on or um, ramming from the back. So, so then that's when this whole, the whole signaling sort of incepted. So, it, it, so from the standard itself, um, so it prevents colliding with other rolling stock, derailing. So if you see a point or a switch, um, so if you've got a railway and then a point of switch is a turnout, and then if the points are not properly aligned or not properly detected, um, trains can derail. So that's that's another use. So colliding with road users, so you've got level crossings and pedestrian crossings, and being incompatible with infrastructure. So if if it doesn't connect to the other um, infrastructure or if it doesn't talk with uh, the other interfaces which I'll uh, have a separate uh, slide on um, especially to the stations and and to um, the road network that can actually cause a few issues and obviously protecting the rail safety workers so anyone working on the railways um, especially railways are live almost uh, 24 hours so there's a lot of work that needs to happen while the trains are running on the network. So what, what the signaling does is it provides the protection by indicating to the driver uh, or blocking part of this, uh, the rail network so that maintenance workers or uh, other rail workers can safely go on to the site 
and get their job done. So we are coming to the signaling equipment. Um, so this is the most simplest sort of um, signaling equipment. Uh, so it's a crane detection. So what you have is a, power, a DC power supply. So this is a DC track circuit. And what you have is a relay on the other end. And then the relay contacts are used for the, um, for the signal. And what you see is, so there's no train or there's no wheel on the track. And, and the current freely flows through the signaling relay and keeps the contact high or up energized. And um, in this section, you would see there's a train wheel. So what, what the train axle does is it short circuits, which means the, the relay would be de-energized, the contact falls, that would connect, uh, that would make a close connection for the, the red signal. So that signal would display red, which means stop. And obviously you probably know green would um, show as uh, clear or proceed. And if you further notice, you would see an insulated gap. That is to, to clearly sort of mark the boundaries around the track circuit. And so then that way you would know which section is occupied when the train is on the track. So usually we call them IRJs or insulated rail joints. And you would notice that there's the reverse polarity in the next track section. So this is just in case if there's a leak through the insulated gap, you don't want to sort of combine two tracks. So to eliminate that, we have the have it the reverse polarity to the next tracks. So we have different kinds, like we have AC tracks, we have um, um, audio um, frequency tracks, um, and uh, and there's the uh, H, uh, HVI, uh, which is the high impulsive um, act, um, uh, sorry, high impulsive um, train detection or, or track circuit, so that sends a high impulsive pulse and, and then uh, picks up a relay. Uh, and then you have a, a micro coded track. So th there's various kinds and various supplies for these. So another train detection method is axle counters. So this is different to the, tra uh, the track circuits we spoke before. So here what happens is you have a transmitting coil, a receiving coil, um, on the axle counter, and whenever a wheel passes through it, that disturbs the, the magnetic field. And by that signal, it counts, it, it connects to a processor where it counts the number of axles pass. So if there's a train coming this way, let's say it has 100 axles, so that would count and say that the whole train has passed here by checking out 100 um, axles. If there is, let's say, part of the train or wheel falls off and left in the track, and then this would have a miscount that would put the block occupied, and that would show on the, um, the on the panel for the controller, network controller, and also uh, for the uh, for the train driver by changing the signal behind it to stop or red. So next we have the, the point machine or the switch, which changes the direction for the track. Um, it's quite simple, but then again, this can be a quite a nightmare for signalers because there's a lot of faults that can happen. And, and also when it happens, that actually um, fails two tracks and, 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 and it's, it's difficult for train to, or trains to be managed or for fleet management. So it's, it's quite important that we always have a good maintenance routine, especially around tracks uh, and, and especially around points uh, and, and, and we keep, to keep the reliability and, and, um, and, and to have uh, time, uh, trains running on time and having a good availability. So we have the check rails or guardrails, and this probably looks like frog legs 
and and actually it is called frog um, because of its look and it guides the wheels onto the track properly. So there's a picture of it. Uh, this is another special picture where this is a dual gauge track. So you have the standard gauge and actually broad gauge. And I've got a um, sort of a mechanical drawing for it. Um, uh, but this is just for a, um, for a broad gauge or, or just for a single track. So you have the driving rods and then you have the, the detection rods. Um, probably not go too much detail on it. So we got train protection as well. So when if the train passes, let's say the driver ignores a red signal, then we have measures to stop the train to apply emergency brakes. So this thing, which looks like a toaster, uh, it actually is an antenna. And what it does is it sends frequencies, um, different frequencies depending on yeah, it's armed or disarmed um, to the train and let know whether to apply uh, the emergency brake. So the frequencies are actually set up in a way that it acts as a, a over speed sensor or, or a uh, train stop, which, is, which means if the signal is at red, whether if it's passing a red signal. So th this is used for our uh, regional trains. So the ones which are not electrified and this is a train stop, which is mechanical. So what it has is a is an arm sort of a, so this arm, it goes up um, when the emergency is to be active. So if the signals are red, so in case if the, the train passes, so in the, in the undercarriage, there is like a trip cock where it gets tripped and then activates the emergency braking. So another important thing is the interlocking, which goes with signaling. So this, this is more like the brain or the, it, it, it does the smart bits. Obviously when you see it, it doesn't look really smart, but what you see is the first, is the historical mechanical interlocking. So you got the levers, and the knots and tappets. So what, what it does is basically, it, it's just a arrangement to prevent conflicting movements. Um, so especially around um, junctions and crossings where you, if to clear the signal, you would have the, the points, everything aligned in the right order uh, so that the signaler can change the, the signal to proceed. So from these mechanical interlockings are still in our network. Um, there are a few regional places and also even in the Metro, which are getting slowly removed. But uh, even though these are about hundred years old, they, they work perfectly. It's just that it cannot be upgraded easily. And in terms of finding resources to having skilled people to work on it is, is also, is, is a question and, and is a challenge. So next we have the relays. Um, so this is like the, uh, the next sort of generation from the mechanical. These are quite popular. These are still around a lot. And if you go into one of these relay rooms, all you hear is just clicking noises. And, and you see there are different types of relays. So you get um, a timer relay with a timer circuit on it and um, a, a twin relay or height uh, or uh, with contacts, with um, heavy duty contacts, especially around points where it has a, a motor that would have more current onto it. And then these ones are the new ones, uh, which are the, the computer-based uh, pro programmable ones, which would fit into a rack. And this would be equivalent to about thousands of relays. So it, it's easily uh, to easy to design, easy to install, easy to maintain. Um, and, and it's very program based and it can be done a lot of uh, work outside of the railway track and then brought to just to up, update it or even remotely being updated. So, um, so I've got a few circuits just to, I'm, I'm sure most of, because I'm talking to engineers, probably they get excited seeing some of the circuits. Um, so here the levers uh, frames would be moving or shifting mechanical rods 
uh, that would place a line to make it available. Um, and then here we have the relays uh, with a combination of contacts would have a function relay that would uh, make that function enable or disable. So these ones are software based. Uh, this is just a PDF print of it. Um, so, but then what it does is it, yeah, it, it, it has, it would have a ladder logic representing the same relay functions here. This is an actual um, diagram. I'm not sure it's visible, but try to, I mean, I won't be able to explain much on it. I mean, yeah, it's it, all you have is tappets, notches, just uh, uh, yeah, pulling across into the, the right positions to make the, a safe movement. Oops. So the signaling interfaces, now that you know some about the, the components of the track, um, probably um, this is just a visual way to show how it all connects together. So we have the <clears throat> network control at the top, uh, then having the signaling equipment room, we have either the relay interlocking, mechanical interlocking, or a CBI or computer-based interlocking, probably can be all together even. I mean, I mean, probably can't think of a place with all three, but generally, yeah, even it can be an option. So then we have the zone boxes, which are field equipments connecting to the signaling. Um, so we have the TPWS, which I spoke about, which is the um, emergency stopper for regional trains. And then we have a symbol for, um, for the metro trains and then, and then the signal. So the signal is controlled by the train controller or, or it can be controlled through the tracks automatically as well. So it, it can be configured either way, but then when it comes to a station, generally it is always controlled by uh, network controllers. Okay. So this is just a, a by function or by interface, how it's connected. So we need power obviously, then we have the interlocking control and indication to the train controller train detection to where, the, where to know, where, where to find out where the train is, then train protection just in case if uh, for a driver error or even uh, a train uh, role, if, if, yeah, if, if uh, because there were instances where uh, train drivers uh, forgot to uh, put the train locks on or the train braking. So similar to a car, if you didn't put the handbrake on, you know, train could roll away. So, for all that protection, we have the, the TPWS or the, the uh, uh, yeah, uh, so that for, for that train protection um, or, or a train stop. And then we have the signals and the signage, then the point mechanism, the railway crossings, communication with fiber optics or, or just cables. And then obviously passing the transfers um, around stations. I'll show a quick video just to recap on what we've discussed so far. Um, let me find the play button for it. Hopefully. Okay, I'm not sure if it's playing at your end or. The Regional Rail Link Rail Systems Team have designed and installed the systems that enable trains to run on the new tracks. A number of different technologies must work together to ensure the network operates safely and reliably. The operation of a train network begins in the control centre. Train controllers sit in a control centre full of computer monitors. Here, they can control and keep an eye on all train movements in the network. The central computer system processes information received from the train controller and various pieces of technology installed across the network. It uses this information to regulate the movement of trains by operating coloured light signals. While the train controller and central computer system are the brain of the train network, Fibre optic cables form the skeleton. 
Fibre optic cable installed throughout the network connects all the different pieces of technology together, allowing them to communicate with each other by sending signals along the cables. Axle counters are devices installed onto the track which detect train movements. After a train passes, signals from axle counters are sent through the fibre optic cables to the central computer system. Signals are the coloured lights which tell the train driver when to go or stop. Information processed from the central computer system is sent to signals along the track informing the sequence in which the colours are to be displayed. A train driver uses coloured signals to drive the train safely along the tracks. The different colour patterns displayed on signals will tell the train driver to stop, to go and at what speed, among other information. Train radio systems have been installed along the network and allow two-way communication between the train controller and the train driver. This technology allows communication through radio waves. Train protection warning systems are safety devices installed on the track. If a train passes a red signal, the device will send out signals to automatically activate the train's brakes. Along the network, pedestrian crossings are installed to allow safe crossing of the railway tracks for pedestrians and cyclists. The crossings are fitted with train activated gates and alarms to improve safety. The technology installed along the track and processed by the central computer system helps to supply passenger information on train platforms such as passenger information display boards informing passengers when the next train is arriving. Other technology which the rail systems team have installed at train stations include hearing loops providing announcements for customers with hearing aids, public address systems announcing trains arriving on the platform, CCTV cameras, and Mikey machines and Mikey readers. The Regional Rail Link Rail Systems team have worked hard to install the technology that will enable trains to run safely and efficiently on the new tracks. So that recap probably what we discussed earlier on. Um, <clears throat> so this is coming back to what the signaling means. Um, in, in terms of its indication and its signage. So what we have here is, I mean, it's quite basic now because with the colors, obviously you would mean, yep, red is stop, yellow is caution, and then you have the green proceed. However, back in the day, it was um, when it's mechanical, uh, then it, it was the rod, uh, uh, it was ha having a horizontal arm. And then when it's fallen, um, it was shown as proceed. And here you have like a fishtail mark. So the, the, the difference between these two signals of these two kinds was this would be operated directly by the, the station master or the, the signaler at the box or at the station. And this distance signal was basically working based on the indication here. So for example, so this is at stop, the home signal. So you call the home signal because it's entering to a station and the starting signal because the train would start on the signal. And um, so this home signal, if it's on stop, and then for the train, it needs enough warning to start braking. So, so the reason behind it is that if you look at the, the braking for trains is actually a lot more higher in sense, it needs a lot more, uh, a lot more leeway, so it needs 286 meters compared to a normal car driving at 70. It needs 36 meters, so so the, the train needs a lot of warning. So hence we have that distant signal. So next we'll discuss. So how do we know to place these signals and where to place these signals, and and also in terms of how do we manage capacity. So I'll move on to that. So what we have is the three aspect headway, which means we have the red and then the warning signal and then the clear signal. So then we could have train following another train with this distance apart. So that would be equivalent to 
So between these signals, you would need a braking distance or a service braking distance so that the driver can actually make a stop having one of these signals at red. So for example, if, if the train runs, um, let me use a pen. If let's say if this is a TD graph, oops, not having straight ones, but so it would come to this clear aspect, go run straight with the same speed and then start braking to make it to a stop for this signal. So this is quite simple. Um, yeah, just um, three aspects. And then also you would notice there's a sighting allowance so that the driver has enough time to read the signal. And then also you have an overlap, which is um, an extra margin um, as a safety margin added uh, on top of the, the service braking distance. And obviously you need to consider the train length. Next, we have four aspect signaling. So what we found was that three aspect wasn't really enough in terms of it because it was taking a lot of headway. So if you compare, especially the headway distance, so it would have two service braking distances. And you know that these service braking distances can be long. And also depending on the line speed, the more the line speed, the, the more the more distance the service braking distance is. And here with four aspects, so you introduce now two other indications that would reduce by a half service braking distance because it's overlapping now. Because it give, now what, what it does is it actually gives extra warning to the driver. So this is more like a two-step braking. So the train comes on a proceed and then identifies that that signal says reduce to medium speed. So for the driver to expect to reach at 40 at the next signal, so he or she will start braking to 40 and then uh, he would have another again apply brakes to stop at this signal so it's like a two <coughs> um, two step braking so this is just to show the aspect sequence um, so i've used just the three aspects just to show how the signaling would work so if the train section is or if the train is in this section and if there's no other trains around, then it would all show proceed. And then if the train is onto this block, then this would give the stop signal to anything behind it. And once it moved here, this becomes red and then it's going to warning. And then once it's cleared off this track, and then it would show the warning and then the proceed. And when it's at a point, so this combination of signal means, so you would notice that there's no direction for the driver given. So the driver wouldn't know just by the signal which way it's actually heading. How it would know is by the combination. So this combination means it's uh, going at a low speed. Um, so oh, 40 Ks uh, taking a turnout. So then the driver would know, okay, he's taking a turnout. But that depends on the obviously the type of turnout, like how curvy it is, or, or depending on the point machine, it's used as well. So I spoke about headway. I mean, I probably didn't define what headway was. So it, uh, what I did was um, I spoke headway in terms of distance, but in reality, what we need to know the headway is by time, because you wouldn't want to go to the station and find out how far the train is by the distance, you would not want to know, okay, how long or in, in time, you basically want to know if is there a train in the next two minutes or five minutes. So this is why we speak headways in terms of time and, and, and the throughput, so how many trains per hour we could run or TPH. So I'm, I'm not gonna read out probably, you can read uh, it yourself. So it basically tells how close two trains can run within, on, the, on the same track. And another thing which is to be noticed is the theoretical headway is, so with signaling what you find is it's the theoretical headway. So on top to that, we need to add the operating headway. So 
for the whole network controller to organize himself or her to organize that operation. So we need to keep about 25% buffer. So what happens is if it comes to be 2.5 minutes for signaling or theoretical, it ends up being four minutes for operational. So how do we do our designs? So we have three sort of principal documents we produce or start off work with. So one main one is the signaling arrangement. So that's a line diagram of track defining where the signals are going to locate and what the aspects are gonna show, location of track circuits, the type the signal. So the overlap is the, the, the extra, um, the space given in case of emergency um, or as a safety, and then also gradient. So, I mean, it could be a fall, it could be a rise, and then also curves. You, you get a lot of curves. Um, I mean, you can't really have a straight track unless sort of you go uh, using over um, like a viaduct, which is sort of now we are moving towards, but obviously it's, it's uh, very expensive uh, in terms of um, having more, more of those running projects. And then next is the control tables. That's the logic which is used for uh, points and signals and, and to set routes. So this is more used for just to identify the con conditions for um, writing up the interlocking. I wouldn't be going into detail of it because uh, that's probably the more intermediate level or, or a bit more higher. So bonding plan is similar to signaling arrangements. Obviously it, it would be um, showing a bit more details around IRJs and also with the electrification uh, where the return traction current comes through as well. So those bonding points um, that I won't discuss today as well um, because that would be probably another separate topic for these two. But I'll show a simple um, uh, and, a, and a sample signal arrangement plan. Um, probably zoom in a bit. So you would see the signal and these symbols mean what kind of aspect it can show, whether it can show red, yellow, and green, or it can only show red. So in this instance, it only shows red and, and what type of signal it is. Also with it, that means that it can be, whether is it being controlled by the network controller or this one, um, I don't know if you can see if it's, it's like a pointy end, um, which means it track operated or automatic. But um, yeah, we'll probably not discuss too much in it because that, that's going into heavy hardcore signaling. And, and when, it, when it comes to placing signals, you start off with identifying where the signal should go as in, so you, when you see a turnout, <clears throat> you would want to have a signal coming towards it um, so that uh, the driver would know uh, which speed or, or to stop before the points are being properly set uh, or set, locked and detect. So that's sort of the, the procedure for it. And then, um, yeah, and then if there's a, I mean, this is, um, uh, yeah, this is just a, a track over a uh, road, uh, but if there was a station, then we would place a signal. And then what we do is then work out the service breaking distance further back of it and then place a signal. Obviously, you would do calculations around, depending on the, uh, the rise or the fall on the gradients or on the curvature. So here, of course, the curvature seems straight, but then the gradients, yeah, we see a few um, rise and falls, actually falls because uh, I mean, I'm looking from um, this end to this end. Oh, sorry, if you can't see, uh, I was talking about thinking trend, oops. Stalking trends coming from this end. So then it was going through the fall direction. Okay, another thing we use is the time distance graph. So when we are um, working out where to place signals, so the signal arrangement doesn't really show the, the whole picture in terms of we can't, identify where the bottlenecks are. So if it's express, if it's a stopper, it would stop at a station. Um, if it's a stopper and then 
the dwell time for passengers to transfer, all that that can be captured on a time distance graph. So this is again train running from, uh, I'll, I'll use the word right to left, but um, in real life, uh, signalers actually call up or down direction. Uh, if it's coming, going towards the city, we say up, and if it's going away from the city, down. And you would notice, so this is based on Excel, uh, but obviously now we are using MicroStation to automate some of these works to produce the, the graph itself, but obviously this is a simple one, but uh, you would notice there's two lines. So what these two lines means is the front of a train and the back of a train, and then it comes to a station and it stays. So this is a time axis and then the distance, and then it would move across and, and it would repeat. So this is a following train. So the front of a following train. So what we want to see is how close can we run another train? So this becomes a headway distance, sorry, headway time. Um, so then that way we know how long or how close uh, we can run the next train. And then obviously the, the one with the biggest gap, that would be the ruling headway. Um, and another thing you probably need to notice is, so we've got the, the aspects here. So just think it as yellow, uh, red, yellow, and green. And for, it, for, for the second train, we are looking at a green signal. So that's when the train can move without braking. Otherwise, if it comes to a yellow, then what we have is a train continuously trying to be braking and, and that's not the, the curve we are looking for. So this is a tool where we, uh, which shows what parameters or what inputs we are gonna use. So the stopping service braking and we are putting what type of train so usually we use the predominant train running on the line, so whether it's, if it's a freight or whether if it's a e emu means the uh, electric uh, multiple unit, which is uh, one of those uh, extra police or the commons, the electrified units. We have a safety margin and we put the gradients and yeah, and we work out uh, what the distances are. And in the Excel, obviously you need to put on the X and Y um, just to plot the graph. Obviously it's, it's all gonna be just the, the motion equations, just not the normal physics. Okay, I'll probably um, now explain what I've discussed through a, a project which is actually happening at the moment. And I, I was lucky enough to work on, on the concept plans for this. Um, and um, this is a short um, video um, on, on how it's working. And, and also this gives also a bit of an idea on how the future of signaling is gonna look like in, in especially in Melbourne. So I'll, hopefully that'll work on your end. You may have heard how the Metro Tunnel will be bringing you more trains more often. How we plan to do this all comes down to signaling. Think of signalling like your body's nervous system. It's not something you can easily see or touch, but it's essential for your body to function. There's a lot that goes into making sure trains run safely and efficiently. Take a look at how signalling worked almost 70 years ago. The controller plots all the trains on a graph. He directs traffic from point to point. The controller gives orders to the signal boxes, where men turn his words to point and signal movements. They're making the road for the train. Black lever to set the points, blue to lock, red to set the signal. A bell warns the next box and, getting ready to take the train, the box returns the signal. This is what's called a fixed block system and though we've been using it for more than 100 years, technology has come a long way since. Here's how it works. Coloured light signals tell the driver when a train is permitted to operate over the sections of track, also known as signal blocks. 
The blocks are set at a fixed distance and, depending on the conditions, they determine how close trains can safely travel along the same line. In other words, if a section of track ahead of a train is occupied, the train can't move forward into the next block. Although this system is safe, it has limits. Because trains are separated by the length of the signal blocks, no matter how fast or slow they're travelling, this affects how frequently they can run. This is where next generation high capacity signalling comes in. The moving block system monitors and controls both the location and speed of trains in real time, moving with the trains and allowing them to safely run closer together. It's a similar concept to the adaptive cruise control function in your car, which adjusts the speed according to your distance from the vehicle ahead. See how moving blocks work compared with the current fixed block signalling. The signal blocks keep a minimal distance between the trains, while moving blocks allow for more flexible movement. Notice the difference? Using specialised equipment, trains will wirelessly relay information to signalling control centres at Sunshine and Dandenong, where their progress is monitored in real time. This will enable trains to maintain safe stopping distances as they move along the network, guided by real-time data to dynamically adjust speeds and braking to move in relation to other trains. It'll also help network operators reduce the impacts of sudden delays or incidents. High capacity signalling keeps trains moving both safely and more efficiently, enabling the Metro Tunnel the capacity to provide a true turn up and go service. Or in other words, more trains more often. So that basically <clears throat> brings my presentation into a conclusion. Um, hopefully I've given um, enough context and demystified some of the, the signaling um, and hopefully I've, I've didn't use much of the jargon or, or confuse you and, and hopefully um, you've understood uh, some of the signaling basics. Um, so Priyanka, I don't know how you're gonna conduct the question and answer session, so I'll leave it up to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Basil. Uh, so, if anyone has questions, you can ask now. Uh, there's no, there are no questions in the chat box, but okay. maybe you have, maybe... Just for thought some... provocation, probably, I'll, I'll probably explain what this building is. Um, probably, if, if I didn't say about it, probably, uh, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't, the, the presentation wouldn't be complete. So this is the Flinders Street station. Um, so it's the first station and then the one of the main stations. Um, it was built in 1854. Um, and probably it looks like a bit more like a, like a South Indian sort of um, uh, architecture. I mean, I, I'm not sure whether it's a real or not, but the myth is that the architectural plans were swapped between a, a plan in the, which was supposed to happen in India and and in in Melbourne, so I'm I'm not sure how entirely the, uh, how true is, but that that's just just for a fun fact. Uh, since nobody has asked questions, in fact, Basil, I have a couple of questions if you don't mind. Yeah. These sure. are more more like the layman's uh, questions, but uh, since I'm not in the rail industry, I would like to know uh, the reason behind using different gauges. Uh, I, I mean, it's not directly related to the signaling, but uh, you may be able to answer that. No, um, that, that's actually an excellent question because um, what, what happened was back in the day when the colonization happened, um, they didn't really think of a national view of how that we, it would connect interstate or all they th thought was that it would be because Australia is so big that they thought oh, there would never be a moment where the the actual states would be having a connected rail so that's why so depending on their background the engineers or the planners if so if they came from the Irish background so that's why we have the the broader gauge so I think even in Sri Lanka it's broad gauge and um, so depending on where their expertise were, so they created their uh, sort of own gauge. This is now actually a problem because now we've connected all the 
the trucks across to other neighboring states and and we are in an operation we are trying to standardize or have one gauge but in victoria we have so much of broad gauge already so it's different or difficult to um, change it back to standard gauge but yeah we are slowly sort of trying to implement that interoperability um, and even we are considering to have uh, rolling stock that are capable of traveling on on by changing the wheel set or um, to match the the gauge so yeah it's it's a very very good question and probably whole, like and if it was only thought 200 or yeah 200 odd years ago they they wouldn't have this problem yeah so is there any issues with when migrating from one gauge to the other does uh, rail manufacturers uh, train manufacturers that had to do something about that uh, or they can easily migrate between the gauges no it's it's not quite easy because i mean obviously because trains are quite bulky and 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 you know it's it's heavy and and also another thing with uh, with the track is that there's certain axle counter tons or certain weight which can go onto all this track so depending on the on the weight it can take so it's not quite easy and um yeah th th that's where where the trouble is and and we've been having this challenge and and we are trying to sort of separate the the regional lines or the interstate lines and then we are ha having the broad gauge line separately so then that way we sort of avoid the question but but then again it, it comes to a point where especially when we're trying to um, procurement rolling stock yeah it has to be custom made just to match the the, the melbourne network okay thank you now in another question i think something you did just didn't uh, touch upon that's mm -hmm. the, the signaling uh, that that can be visible within the train itself i i think uh, because I, every time i travel in the train uh, i wonder why these signals are located outside because it's uh, when the train is traveling at a higher speed it's much harder for the uh, driver to uh, recognize the signaling so uh, what is the future holds for the in train signaling in terms of australia and the world um yeah so if i from an australian point so in sydney they've already have um, so they recently installed i think last year they installed um alstom did the job um so they, they have driverless trains and and it's all in cab so they don't have any track side signaling so the one the one run, one that runs in the tunnels um so we are slowly approaching it uh, with melbourne the problem has been we are having mixed operations on our network so that means we share our track with interstate um, then we regional and freight running on the same line so that causes a bit of an issue but that uh, so but with melbourne metro tunnel we are taking one step closer to sort of have a dedicated train line and then slowly sort of move towards that grade of automation so there's a uh, grade of automation level so goa one to four so four is like completely driverless and and with cab signaling it's the same so you have um, in in europe we call the european train control system so that has levels two so level uh, starting from um, from one or zero and then uh, it goes to three so three is like fully communication based and no track side whereas the the bare minimum would be having a track side but then having some of the um, uh, the communication via wireless and then we have cbtc which you would see in singapore network that has all in cab and then also driverless and the drivers can operate in case of an emergency or degraded motion uh, degraded situation so that means if there's probably a fault or or an issue in the network so then drivers can uh, open up uh, the cab and then start driving it manually uh, but then the signaling mostly is yeah in, in the driver's um, view not not outside or on the track side so yes it, it's moving towards that uh, but in australia probably it's in the long term plan especially in melbourne uh, in other states it's actually 
some of the states actually it's moving quite fast. Like the freight network, uh, the picture I showed on Rio Tinto, they've already done it. So they have a fully automated um, rail network there for Rio Tinto um, and yeah. So, so it, it is happening, but in some states it's taking baby steps and whereas you know, other, sta other states are actually moving quite fast. Okay, thank you. I guess there's no other questions. Yeah, that's so fine. I, on behalf of IT Young Professional, I thank you, Pesala, for your valuable presentation. It's in, and indeed a an, uh, very interesting one. And uh, many, for many of us, it's very, uh, it's not very familiar, the subject. So we thank you again. And especially I thank you for uh, staying this late and doing this valuable presentation for us now it's i think past one o'clock uh, in melbourne yep. so thank you for that uh, we it. hope uh, we'll uh, keep in touch with you in our future events as well so yep. i thank for the audience as well for participating in this uh, webinar uh, so we'll meet again thank you Pesala. yeah uh, thanks thanks priyanka and um, yeah and also thanks for the viewers as well and also, if, if anyone likes to connect on LinkedIn and, you know, if there's any further questions or anything like that, I'm happy to um, answer or, or even provide information that I would uh, can get across. And also stay safe from COVID and everything else. And, and also Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you. On the final note, we'll be uploading the presentation uh, on YouTube as well. So we'll share the link with you all. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Priyanka. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Oh, welcome. Thanks.